Let me ask you, have you ever received an invitation before? Ever received an invitation? I, I don't see every hand raised. I know you've received an invitation because I personally invited almost everybody here to various things at the church. Yes. Maybe you've received an invitation to a celebration, perhaps to a party or to a big event of some kind. Now, I know it's been a while since we've had big birthday bashes. Remember back in April when people were having parades of cars that would go by somebody's house and wave happy birthday and all those kinds of things? It seems like now we've gotten kind of more used to the idea of birthdays and isolation and working around some of those things. But it's been a while since we had those big bashes, right? And the holiday gatherings, the music concerts, the backyard barbecues. But I think we all remember how wonderful it is and how exciting to be invited. I remember at the beginning of August when we as a deacon board with some trepidation said, hey, let's just have a little picnic in the parking lot and we'll see how things go. People need something to look forward to. And I mentioned it to people and it was like the like this light return in their eyes, like, yes, there's actually something happening, something I can look forward to. And it was neat because people for so long have gone without an invitation. We love to look forward. We love the anticipation. We love the excitement, the plans. There's nothing quite like being invited. And while that picnic in the parking lot may have been a very scaled-down version of our annual block party that we look forward to each year. It was still a sweet time to be together, and it turned out to be a gorgeous and wonderful day. Although, as I said earlier, there were a few uninvited guests. Yeah, yeah. A few uninvited guests with wings and stingers that came to bother us <laughs> while we drank our pop and ate our sweet fruit. You know, it's been tough coming to grips with all the wonderful events and celebrations that have been canceled this year. It's almost as if rather than tracing 2020 from January 1st, I trace it from about March 15th because it seemed like March 15th was the date that everything started to change. It started for us here at church with an event that we've been looking forward to for more than a year and a half, Winter Jam. We were going to go to Winter Jam and enjoy wonderful Christian bands playing at the Sears Center, and everyone was wondering that week, would it be canceled, would it not be canceled? And I was thinking to myself, even if it's not canceled, I'm not sure that we should even go. All of those things. And then it came down to sports and even school, and here at church, Awana and the Easter egg hunt, you name it. The, the invitations stopped coming. In fact, rather than getting invitations, our email inboxes and our mailboxes started to be filled with messages of don't come. Don't come. And then eventually we got our acts together and we invited people to join us remotely or by telephone. But let me tell you, even though at the beginning of the pandemic and perhaps throughout the spring and summer, those invitations <laughs> stopped coming, there's one invitation that remained the entire time. One voice continued to invite us to gather, if not in person, then in spirit. One voice inviting us to come, to leave our worries and fears and anxieties, to walk away from worldly attachments, to leave behind sinful entanglements, and to simply come. Come to Jesus. Come. Today we conclude our series, Come, Your Personal Invitation to the Greatest Celebration. And we see the gracious invitation of the Lord throughout all the pages of Scripture. So whether or not you've received a lot of invitations in your life, earlier when I asked you to raise your hand if you've received an invitation, maybe you had to think, man, it's been months or years since I've been invited to something. But let me tell you, every single day you hear from our very God, the creator of all things, the most wonderful invitation of all to come. And so in the Psalms, we have this invitation. If you see it on the screen, read it with me. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. In response to his greatness, his goodness, his glory, his majesty, we lift our voices in song to Jesus. And that's just the basic responsibility of Christians and of God's people from the earliest times to come 
and to lift up a voice of praise and to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs in response to his goodness. From the prophets, we have this call to come. Read it with me. Come, let us return to the Lord. And so the prophet's primary job was to make the people aware of their sin, of the way that they had broke the covenant with the Lord, and to call them to acknowledge their sin and to turn from it and to return to the Lord, as the prophet Hosea says. The Lord Jesus, when he invites the fishermen, he says, come, read it with me, come, follow me. Come, follow me. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And what will he give us? Rest. 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 Come to me, and I will give you rest. Rest. And the angels, as we saw last week, at the tomb of Jesus, speaking to the women, said to them, come. See the place where he lived. See the place where he lived. The tomb was empty. And because the tomb is empty, our hearts are full. Because Jesus lives, we will live also. And so this is the great invitation that we have from our Lord Jesus Christ and even from the angels. As at the tomb of Lazarus, so to the sinner's heart, Jesus says, come out of your grave. Come to me and live, Jesus says, to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. And to the local church, to churches like ours, Jesus says, unbind them and let them go. Show them the freedom they have in Christ to live the life that is truly life. Many people think of religion as a bunch of rules, and indeed that's what religion is. But this isn't about religion. This is about relationship. And relationship sets us free to love and to live and to enjoy life the way that God has created it to be lived. Recognizing, of course, that even our sweetest times of fellowship and relationship together are nothing in comparison to what lies in store. Come, see the place where he lay. Just as Jesus is risen from the dead, so we too, in Christ, will be risen, will be raised with Christ one day. So as we conclude our journey through these calls in Scripture to come, through the great invitations of Scripture, today we come to perhaps the greatest invitation of all. And I have to tell you, the invitation is absolutely exclusive. You might say, sure, I get invitations to stuff, but it's the kind that comes by postcard and mail and pretty much got sent to the whole neighborhood. Everybody got invited. Well, this is an exclusive invitation. And the cool thing is, it's absolutely exclusively available in Jesus Christ. And it's an invitation wonderfully made to all. And guess what? I'm invited. You say, great, what about me? <laughs> guess what? You're invited to. Amen? Amen? You're invited to. The question is, will you answer the call? This isn't one of those invitations you get in the mail and just kind of throw it on a shelf and forget about it until it's too late to RSVP, although sadly some people do. Some people receive this invitation from the Lord to come, to turn from sin, to trust in Jesus, and it's like that invitation in the mail you stick on the shelf and forget about until one day is too late and the RSVP period has passed and you find yourself ultimately in the outside looking in. I pray that is not the case for anybody in this room. I pray not the case for anybody watching online today or joining us via Zoom. I pray that you have received the invitation and that you have responded appropriately by receiving Jesus and answering his call to come. So let's start today in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew 22, we find ourselves on Tuesday of a very special week. What week am I talking about? Sometimes we call it Passion Week. More often it's called Holy Week. Holy Week. The week between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. That includes the climactic events of Jesus in Jerusalem. 
his interactions with the religious leaders, ultimately his supper with the disciples in the upper room, his prayer in the garden, his betrayal by Judas, his arrest, his trial, his floggings and scourging before Pilate, ultimately the shouts of crucify him, he's led to Golgotha where he is crucified on the cross, buried, and on the third day, triumph. He's risen, as he said. But today we're going to pick up the story in Matthew 22. This is Tuesday of Holy Week. And in Matthew 21, verse 42, we'll go back a couple of verses and start there. Jesus says to the religious leaders, these are the leaders who themselves have rejected Jesus, who has given every sign and teaching that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, the promised one who was to come. The religious leaders have rejected him, and not only have they rejected him, but they have turned the people aside from following Jesus as well. They have taught those whom they were entrusted to lead, and they have taught them falsely and led them incorrectly. Jesus says in verse 42 of Matthew 21, have you never read in the scriptures, and then quoting Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The cornerstone is the stone of ultimate prominence and utmost importance in a building. It's that upon which all else is built around and upon. And Jesus is saying, that's who I am. He'll be a rock of stumbling to some. It says in verse 23, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And what are the fruits of the people who are part of the kingdom of God? It's the fruit of repentance, turning from sin and self-reliance and turning in trust and commitment to follow to Jesus, producing its fruits by the Holy Spirit who will indwell them. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces when it falls on anyone. It will crush him. There's great blessing for those who build their lives upon the foundation of Jesus. But there's a warning because there's judgment for those who refuse him. Verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the cross because they held him to be a prophet. And then Jesus tells another parable. It says again, chapter 22, verse 1, Jesus spoke to them. And I think he's probably addressing the religious leaders and all the people who are gathered around him. And he said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. A king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So here we have a mighty king. And this would have been a huge doing. A wedding feast for his son. And he invites everyone to come. He sends his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. So the invitation goes out. Now, in ancient times, there would have been two invitations. The first invitation would have been kind of like our save the date invitation today. A wonderful celebration is happening, and you're all invited. Okay, So it's kind of like the, the preliminary invitation. But then there's a secondary invitation that would be given when everything was ready. When everything was ready. So the preliminary invitation goes out. But no one RSVPs. No one wants to come to the great wedding feast of the king's son. And I think the imagery here should be pretty clear to us. What things stand for. God the Father. The wedding feast the wedding supper of the Lamb, the celebration of Jesus, Messiah. Verse 4 says again, He sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. 
Everything is prepared. Everything is all set. Come to the wedding feast. It would have been a great sign of disrespect and dishonor to not come to the king's feast. And yet, what happens? Verse 5 says, They paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his service, treated them shamefully, shamefully, and killed them. So here in Matthew 22, we have the invitation of the king. Say it with me. Come to the wedding feast. Say it one more time. Come to the wedding feast. Come to the feast. Come join the party. Come to the celebration for my son. And yet they refuse to come. One is busy running his farm. Another one has some kind of business to attend to, and so they're not able to go. Still others, it says, treat the servants shamefully and kill them. And just as earlier in Matthew 21, the picture there of treating the servants shamefully and killing them is a picture of how the people treated the prophets of old who confronted them with their sin, who called them to repent, and also how they will respond to the messengers of Jesus, the apostles, and those who proclaim the good news. Now the king, how do you think he responds? Is the king just kind of like shrugging his shoulders like, well, I guess nobody's coming to my party? No, the king is angry, it says in verse 7. He sent his troops. It says he destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Some see here an illusion, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen some 40 years in the future. If Jesus is speaking these words in A.D. 30, 40 years later in A.D. 70, Roman general Titus, having besieged the city of Jerusalem, is going to destroy it and burn it. Some see here an allusion to what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Destroy those murderers, burn their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Exclusive invitations went out. Rejected. The people did not show up. They did not come. And so the king says, go out and invite the commoners. Invite everybody. If you flip back to chapter 21, chapter 21, verse 31, Jesus, describing the importance of obedience to his call, says, truly I say to you, and he's talking to the religious leaders, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. In other words, Jesus takes two groups of individuals that the hypocritical, religious, holier-than-thou folks of his day would have looked down their nose upon, the tax collectors, those who were turncoats for Rome, and the prostitutes as being emblematic of the sexually immoral people of their day, people that these holier-than-thou religious people would have looked to look down their noses upon, and Jesus says, they enter the kingdom of God ahead of you. Now, why is that? What does he mean here? It's the same picture as the party in verse 22, the feast that the king is throwing. The wedding hall is filled with guests, both good and bad. You see, these are those who have responded to the invitation. They've heard the call of the prophets to turn from their sin. They've heard the call of the last prophet, John the Baptist, confronted with their sin, their cup to the heart. And they say, what must we do? What must we do? And so they turn from their sin. And in Jesus, they find the one 
for whom the way was prepared. In repentance, the way is prepared for faith and salvation. And they trust in Jesus as their Savior. And they are those who celebrate the wedding feast. They are the guests, Jews and Gentiles together, who make up the kingdom of God. Verse 11, Matthew 22 says, When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw a man there who had no wedding clothes. That doesn't mean that he was naked. In our Genesis study, we learned about the sordid episode of Noah drinking too much and being uncovered in his tent and Ham making fun of him and Shem and Japheth going in. That was our study this morning. But that's not what's happening here. The king would have given each of the wedding guests a special set of clothes. That was part of the invitation, not just the feast, not just the celebration, not just the good times, but a special garment, a special set of clothes, so that everybody could be well clothed at this feast. But one guy's not wearing his wedding garment. I believe this wedding garment is a picture of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Both righteousness in terms of lived out righteousness, but also the righteousness that is received when somebody turns from their sins and trusts in Jesus. It's that right standing with God that we receive by grace through faith in Jesus. That's what justification is all about, right standing with God. There's one there who has no wedding garments. The king says to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And a man was speechless. The king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he's cast out along with all the other ones who ignored the king's invitation to come. And then Jesus concludes with these words. Read it with me. It's on the screen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. What did Jesus mean by these words? Well, I think it's rather simple, really, that the invitation goes out to everyone. The invitation goes out to everyone, but few will respond. Few are chosen is a reference to those who, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, turn from their sins, trust in him, are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, they stand right before God at the bar of his judgment. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but were made alive by grace through faith in Jesus. This isn't anything having to do with ourselves. Nothing to do with our own good works or our own good intentions or any of that, but purely by the mercy and grace and call of God that we stand before him. I love that line from the solid rock that we sang in our hymn earlier, clothed in his righteousness alone. Boldly we stand before the throne. What a beautiful picture. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. So you might see this and you might say, many are called, the invitation goes out to everybody, but few are chosen. How do I know if I'm among the chosen? You don't have to raise your hand, but maybe that causes you a little bit of pause. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I, I, I'm hearing the word of God now. I'm hearing the call. I've heard the call to respond to the gospel many times. I know I'm among the many who are called, but how do I know if I'm among the few who are chosen? Well, really, I think it's, it's actually rather simple. How do you know if you're chosen? You answer the call. You RSVP to the invitation. You turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus. And for those who are trusting in Jesus as sin's forgiver, those who are following Jesus as life's leader, they show themselves in the fruits of their decision to be among the chosen. But speaking in theological terms of God's general calling to all and his efficacious calling of the elect, and that might be fun for philosophers and theologians to talk about, but ultimately, if you're concerned whether or not you're part of the chosen, have you answered the call? Are you following Jesus? Are you among those who persevere in the following after 
Jesus. And if you are, then you are among those clothed in his righteousness alone. Boldly, you look forward to standing before his throne. And so we have this simple invitation from the king. Come to the wedding feast. And I would urge you to RSVP before it's too late. I would urge you to respond now. Today is the day of salvation. To all who received and to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children of God, no longer enemies of God, but adopted as sons and daughters into God's family. Full rights of inheritance, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And I would urge you, choose your wardrobe carefully. You're not going to get into this great banquet wearing clothes of your own good works. You have to be trusting in Jesus. And Jesus alone, clothed in his righteousness, which is granted to you. And which shows itself in our righteous works. By the way, let's flip over to Revelation. We're going to spend our closing moments together in the book of Revelation. Revelation, in a couple of places, describes the wedding clothes that we, as the redeemed, will be wearing on that glorious day in the future. Revelation 19, verse 8, says of the bride, the church, Jews and Gentiles, people from every tribe and tongue and language, an innumerable, innumerable multitude. It says it was granted, Revelation 19, 8, it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. These are the wedding clothes that are given. For fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The righteousness of Jesus will show itself and the fruits of righteousness, right decisions, right choices as we follow hard after our Savior Jesus. Also, Revelation 22 and verse 14. Revelation 22 and verse 14 says, Blessed are those who wash their robes. Those who wash their robes. And some manuscripts say, and do his commandments. So that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. And so we have washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb who have been redeemed. We put on the righteousness of Jesus and we boldly stand before his throne. So choose your wardrobe carefully. Number one, RSVP. Reply to the invitation. Not fine in your notes if you're taking notes, by the way. But number one, RSVP. Say that with me. RSVP. Respond to the invitation. Repent and turn to Jesus. Number two, choose your wardrobe carefully. And number three, come to the party. Answer the call and be among the chosen few. Many are called, but few are chosen. Answer the call and come to the table. Now, when you get an invitation, there's a few questions you might ask before responding. You might ask yourself, Okay, am I going to go to this party or not? All right, first of all, who's hosting the party? If my kids, my teenagers came home one day and said, I'm invited to a party. First of all, I'd say, you do realize we're in the midst of a pandemic. Right? But in normal times, if my teenagers came home and said, I've got an invitation to a party, I'd say, oh, who's hosting the party? Where's the party being held? Who else is going to be there? And even as adults, if you're invited to a party, you might say, oh, who's hosting? Oh, okay. I like that person. Where's the party going to be? Oh, okay, that's a nice place. That's a nice venue. But then the next question, who else is going to be there? Let's turn to the last book of the Bible briefly, the book of Revelation, as we find out a little more about this incredible invitation. As the angel said to John the Apostle, read it with me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Come. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now, I believe that one clear picture of that bride is painted for us in Revelation chapter 7. Now, there's some disagreement as to these two different groups of people. You've probably heard many different theories about the 144,000 of Israel who are sealed. And maybe not as much disagreement about the second group of people that are mentioned here, 
personally, and you know, please don't theologically execute me for this. Personally, I believe that it's highly likely the 144,000, 12 times 12 times 1,000 uh, is a symbol of perfection and completion. When you look at the tribes that are listed, I think it's probably a picture of the chosen people of God not to be distinguished from the group described in verses 9 and following, the great multitude from every nation. It says in verse 9, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes. White robes, the righteousness of Jesus, the righteousness of their changed lives. And they had palm branches in their hands. Palm branches, a symbol of, of triumph. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits in the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders, the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne. They worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these that are clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, two opinions here, by the way. There's lots of opinions when it comes to Revelation, right? The two opinions here are that, one, these have come through that great period of, revel of tribulation at the end of time either prior to or subsequent from the return of Christ, great tribulation, or these are a description of all the redeemed who have persevered and who have suffered throughout the age of the church. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them the springs of living water. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now we're not yet to the time of resurrection described at the end of Revelation. This is describing the spiritual experience of bliss within the presence of Jesus in paradise. And look at this crowd, how it's described in verse 9. A great multitude, no one can number. Every nation, all tribes and peoples. This is true diversity. This is true unity. This is what we want to see in our culture today in America. And we're not seeing it. And it, and it frustrates us. And it frustrates us because we know how beautiful this is. But this is what we have to look forward to as Christians. Only Christ and only in the kingdom of God and only in him can we experience this incredible unity, even in the midst of the beauty of diversity. That's what we have to look forward to in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And no matter how we necessarily figure the timing of events described in Revelation, what a beautiful picture of the bride, all wearing the righteousness of Jesus here in this verse. Look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Chapter 18 describes the fall of Babylon. The fall of Babylon. But chapter 19 describes this rejoicing in heaven. Babylon the Great, I believe, a picture of the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world has finally fallen and been judged. And now we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 6, the great multitude returns. I have heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. This is the song of the redeemed. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God. As John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And who is the bride? 
church? We are. <laughs> we are the bride, the church of Jesus Christ. Those who trust in his name, we are the bride. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so you may remember in John 14 that Jesus told his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be worried. Don't be distressed. Don't be overwhelmed with anxiety. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come. I'm going to come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And one of his disciples, maybe boldly, maybe trepidatiously, raises his hand and says, Lord, we, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus says to him, you know me. You already know the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. A lot of people have a hard time with the exclusive exclusivity of Christianity, but the fact of the matter is the invitation goes out to everybody. In fact, that's why the church exists. The church doesn't exist to be the largest property owner in the world. The church doesn't exist even to be a social service agency, though that's incredibly important. The church doesn't exist to continue holding traditional religious services that are the opiate of the people. That's not why the church exists. The church exists to bring glory to Jesus Christ by proclaiming the reality of his death on the cross for the sins of all and his resurrection from the grave. The church exists to be a witness to Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why the moment we turn from our sins and trust in Jesus, God doesn't just whisk us out of this horrible, evil world and take us right to heaven. Because he's got a job for us to do, a calling for us to bear witness in this time and in this place. That's what we are to do. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And guess what? The marriage supper of the Lamb is that moment where the bridegroom returns and where the great celebration happens. The place is prepared. The new Jerusalem from heaven is soon going to uh, descend. But before any of that takes place, Jesus returns riding on a white horse, this time not coming on a peaceful donkey, a beast of burden, but this time coming on a white charger, his robe dipped in the blood of his enemies, king of kings, lord of lords, about to inaugurate his thousand-year reign, his millennial kingdom, about to overthrow the beast and the false prophet and to imprison the dragon, the great deceiver, Satan himself. But before that, there's another call to come that maybe you're not very familiar with. Are any of you familiar with the call of the angel in Revelation 19, verse 17? We have this come, let's go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. But in chapter 19 and verse 17, read it with me, it says, come gather for the great supper of God. This is literally an invitation for the birds. The angel, the destroying angel, is calling upon the birds that fly overhead to, carry, to come as carnivores and to devour the flesh of God's enemies. Wow. You see, there's a reminder here that even in the midst of this incredible, wonderful, super exciting invitation, there's also a consequence. Just as the story Jesus told about those who rejected the king's invitation to the wedding feast, there's a consequence if you reject God's invitation to turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. 
And even while the redeemed are celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb, God's enemies upon earth are vanquished. And it says, come to the birds, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses, riders, and so on, so forth. All the mighty ones of this world, the kingdom of this world, those who are allied against the kingdom of God will be taken down in the end. So you have to ask yourself, whose kingdom are you living for? What alliances have you made? What agreements have you made? There's a very stern warning in Revelation 18 and verse 4. In the midst of describing Babylon the great, she who's drunk on the blood of the saints and the wine of immorality, in the midst of describing all of the luxurious living of the merchants and how they're living for temporary pleasures rather than the eternal promises of God, Revelation 18 verse 4 says, The voice from heaven to the people of God, Come out of her, my people. Those of us who have been called by God, who have accepted the invitation of the kingdom, must not align ourselves with the kingdom of this world. And right now, in an election year, there are many Christians, perhaps, who are blurring the lines a bit. I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved in politics or society. Of course we should. But we've got to be really, really careful that we don't align ourselves with the candidates and not with the king. Amen? Amen. Yeah. We need to be very, very careful with the alliances that we have, and not being unequally yoked. Some people have thought that only applies to marrying a non-believer as a Christian. No, it applies to any binding relationship. We need to be very, very careful about that as Christian. And even if we are part of movements, even if we are part of political parties, we need to be very, very clear where our ultimate allegiance lies. And the second that our involvement in that organization would cause us to in any way deny our Savior or to in any way go against his kingdom directives. We need to be very clear that ultimately we serve Jesus and we obey him alone. So it says, come out from her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her pledges, her sins are heaped as high as heaven. God has remembered her iniquities. Come out from her, my people. So remember that word of the Lord to the church, to the bride. Read it with me. It's on the screen. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sin, lest you share in her plagues. Come out of her, my people. And so when we answer this call to come, it's a wonderful, glorious, incredible celebration to come. We come out of the kingdom of the world. We come into the kingdom of Christ. And my question for you is, will you come? Jesus himself is inviting you personally to the greatest celebration. Will you come? Will you come to enjoy the life with the king in the kingdom of God? The spirit and the bride say come. Let him who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires the water of life, take it without price. Come is the call. The spirit says, come. The bride, the church says, come. My invitation to you today is to come. Jesus says, Surely I am coming soon. And we say in response, Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Surely I am coming soon. And we say in response, Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm talking to Christians today, but before I conclude, I want to address anyone who's either here present or with us online who is not trusting in Jesus, who has not come, coming out of the kingdom of this world and answering the invitation to come into the kingdom of Christ. I would urge you 
The invitation has gone out. You've heard it today. I'm sure not for the very first time, but even if for the very first time, now you have received your invitation. Now you have received your invite from King Jesus himself. Come, turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. I'm going to lead in a prayer right now. I would invite you to pray along with me, either coming to Jesus for the very first time or committing as a follower of Jesus to continuing in the way. Lord Jesus, I have heard your call today. I feel the very Spirit of God drawing me to you. And so I come out of my grave. I come out from the world. And I come to you, King Jesus. You died on the cross for my sins. You rose from the grave on the third day. And now I call out to you, save me, Lord. Lord Jesus, I come. Lord Jesus, I come. And for those of us who have already come, who have received the invitation, who are children of God, not by any choice of will, but by the very choice of God, Lord Jesus, we say to you, fill us with your spirit. Continue to use us. Help us persevere every single day. May we come out from the world. May we show ourselves to be sons and daughters of the King. May we be counted among those who love your appearing, Lord Jesus, for you are coming soon. And we say, come, Lord. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Tom, I'm going to ask you to help me out real quick. I've got a, uh, a video we're going to watch just as we conclude, and then we are going to share with each other in a time of communion. This song is by Cyborg Walk Prophets. It's called Come to the Table. May this be your invitation to come to the table with Jesus. We all start on the outside, the outside looking in. This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to get of oh, the shape that we were in. And just when all hope seemed lost, love opened the door for us. He said, Come. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table.